before I go out introducing our panel here today, uh, and we get into the discussion, I'm sure all of you would have noticed uh, the quick poll that we have put up. So I would uh, encourage you to kind of take part in that little survey. So it kind of helps us understand, you know, what kind of value do certifications and standardization hold for all of us out here today. So do take a look at that. So while we're answering that, uh, I would also like all of you to just kind of imagine for a moment, you know, in life where we have no standards and what if no one asked us for metrics or benchmarks before approving a budget or what if there are no processes or policies to follow or even no data to maintain for that matter? You know, would life really be really that easy for all of us? I think without standards, there would be no foundation to learn especially what's happening in the industry, what's happening with other organizations across uh, the industry, and also what kind of best practices there are and what kind of options there are in the world. So when the pandemic kind of hit us, you know, everyone, I mean, across the sectors, be it cleaning, be it FM, even real estate, one had to really take a step back and analyze what's the best way forward. And I think that's where we really got our training, our entire thing that we've learned all these years that came into play and that kind of helped us during these pressing times so especially now today we have with us three very eminent speakers in their respective fields to help us to relook at the way that we train professionals for this next phase and also understand that the value of certifications and standardizations hold for us so I welcome all three of you. I welcome Ms. Hind Almari, the CEO of Dubai Real Estate Institute, and Mr. Stan Mitchell, who is the CEO of Key Facilities Management and the chairman of ISO TC267, and also Mr. Tommy Taylor, the director of T. Taylor Solutions, and also a CIMS and IC expert. Thank you all for joining in today, and welcome to Community Talks. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Well, as we wait for the results uh, of the poll, I, of course, also encourage every one of you to post in your thoughts, your opinions and questions to our panelists. Of course, you know the drill. Uh, just post that in the chat box out there. And we want to make this as engaging as possible. And after all, you know, we are calling the series Community Talks. <laughs> so let's open out the discussion. I want to start off uh, by asking you, Mr. Tommy, you know, what are some of the kind of key uh, practices that the cleaning sector really had to learn during this whole pandemic and then we'll move on to the others as well. Um, I think one of the key things is about uh, disinfection, sanitization. People didn't really know, um, well say didn't really know, they probably didn't practice in the right manner um, what disinfection was at the prior to COVID-19. Um, so it made the industry focus uh, really on on you know, best practice, uh, what's the right practice, because, you know, before that scenario, we were slightly deterred from using disinfectants habitually um, because this wasn't necessary. Uh, and it also was a situation where we cleaned really just for aesthetics, just for the look, rather than actually for disinfection, apart from in food practice areas or in toilets and washrooms. So it's made us change in that respect um, in terms of how we look at disinfection, how we actually supply our service to our clients. And I would hope that in some ways it's actually changed the client's point of view in terms of what they expect from us as a clean industry. Uh, Ms. Hen, would you like to also answer that question for us? Um, can you repeat the question again, Adir? I didn't sure. Hear you. sure. What are some of the key practices that, you know, the real estate industry, like the sector had to really learn during the entire pandemic? To learn. Um, to be honest, uh, the real estate sector is a, is a very unique. It's vibrant. It's uh, ever changing. And based on um, 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 knowledge, it's a knowledge uh, economy based. So lots of practices were changed and uh, um, um, new lessons learned. So looking at uh, the, the practices, um, I would say agility. The COVID has accelerated trend, uh, new trends 
uh, across the globe economy and in, uh, in global governance as well. Um, um, working from home has become standard practices across uh, many sectors uh, with future technologies such as digital infrastructure and, um, uh, and more important to uh, grow uh, more than before. Um, uh, we're lucky with the, with the smart government uh, in the UAE that they reacted um, um, quickly. And we noticed the non-oil private sector has returned uh, to economic growth and um, um, airports are open and um, we're expecting um, more uh, tourists. So uh, the real estate sector, the tourism sector needs to be ready for, for such um, a new norm and a new lifestyle. Um, uh, real estate developers and city makers uh, need to rethink their old designs and improve their work model to fit the new lifestyle with pandemic and limited financial resources. Um, as Han Sheikh Mohammed Bar Rashid Al Maktoum um, in his last uh, virtual cabinet meeting uh, directed officials uh, to develop a national strategy for the post COVID era which means that a new policies, a new um, uh, structure and directions uh, will come to the country to affect the economy, uh, to boost it, uh, not forgetting that exports coming. So um, we expect that uh, more practices to be uh, introduced to the market, especially the real estate market. Right. Uh, Mr. Stan, also for uh, the facilities management sector, we, of course, uh, FM has always been quite forward in terms of using technology for, uh, you know, for different situations. So how did that impact uh, the FM sector, the pandemic? Mr. Stan, are you able to hear me? I think um, the, the FM sector, in theory, um, uh, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I think there's a slight slack, but yes. Yes, okay. Um, I, yeah, the, the signal doesn't seem to be great. So I will uh, carry on if I can, and uh, you'll let me know if... I'm not coming through. Uh, the FM sector, in theory, um, this is business as usual because, uh, Tom, the emphasis on cleaning hygiene in theory has always been there. It's been part of our core responsibilities uh, for many, many years. Uh, the difference here is that we have very specific uh, requirements that we have to meet in order to give people who occupy the facilities the confidence to come back to the workplace as and when that's determined um, and to make sure that they um, are feel safe when do so. The other aspect of FM that is a challenge and a difference is as uh, Hen has just mentioned where different governments come up with different strategies and policies and the reality of the situation is that will keep changing because this virus is going to be with us for a very long time. Um, in terms of technologies, it is also bringing um, the use of IoT type technologies to the fore, where in a facilities management context, we can use them both to manage social distancing, but also to manage um, the environment in which we are asking people to work and all. We can measure uh, that environment in terms of air changes and filter performances, etc. So for facilities management, the whole pandemic is actually a, a great opportunity for us sector to demonstrate that the value and the importance of what we do to the organizations that we serve and how we have a role to play in ensuring compliance with the different governmental policies and restrictions. Great. So as uh, we are, we're just waiting for the results of uh, the poll that we started off with. Uh, I want to ask uh, you, Ms. Hind, I want to again uh, get into the kind of value of certification and standardization. Of course, we want to know what the audience also thinks about this. But in today's time, you know, what value does certifications or even standardizations hold in the industry? Um. 
Despite the COVID, the real estate industry uh, witnessed lots of crises, different ups and downs, and economic cycles. Uh, professionals associated with the real estate sector uh, has to keep, and I always say, uh, say this, keep a keen eye on the latest development to remain relevant and effective in this business. Um, real estate professionals um, who continue to educate and train themselves and get specific uh, designations are um, integral part of the industry's growth ma matrix. With factors such as continuous development, digitalization, and new technologies, uh, global investors, the real estate sector needs um, an interrupted supply of qualified professionals who keep themselves abreast of the ever-changing industry. Uh, yes, training and standardization are important um, due to the raising competition, the, uh, the business style in Dubai, new projects, um, continuous regulatory reframe um, are key ingredients of the real estate market, which uh, consequently uh, property firms in the Emirates and in the UAE have to ensure that their professionals, their realtors, undergo regular training and carry uh, the right local and international designation to, re to remain up to, uh, to date uh, with the market standards. Um, we at Dubai State Institute, we offer um, many qualifications, many certifications, uh, whether executive, um, 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 professional, or academic uh, degrees and uh, designations for such professionals, who I always call them the face of Dubai, because Dubai is known with its um, high-end properties, high-rise, the Burj Khalifa, and such um, um, golden uh, um, uh, and very unique uh, state-of-art properties. Uh, we offer lots of um, uh, uh, courses with different professionals and um, uh, university uh, partnership, internationally well-known universities, and in different languages um, as well. Um, I need to mention this. The, the, um, the U.S.-based uh, Association for Talent Development, um, um, according to their uh, statement and reports, companies that offer comprehensive training and uh, um, uh, courses for, for uh, um, their employees, uh, they are higher with a 218 percentage um, income per employee from companies that don't formalize training. And companies with dynamic training programs enjoy 24% higher profit margin than other companies, of course. Okay, that's quite interesting. And, and it was really interesting what you said that they are the face of Dubai. I mean, especially during the pandemic, one thing that we did see was all the three sectors that we're talking about here today, be it cleaning, be it facility management and real estate, they truly ended up being the unsung heroes who came into the limelight, uh, you know, uh, not to forget the healthcare sector as well as uh, the face of uh, Dubai, especially in this region. So uh, I'm just waiting for the results of the poll that we did start off with. So once we see the results, I would definitely want to have you to analyze it as well. So... So it looks like we had a tie between yes and maybe. Okay. So, Mr. Stan, I want to ask you, you know, taking a look at the results as well, you know, what exactly do you feel should, uh, what kind of value, again, does uh, standardizations hold in the industry? And also right now, I want to ask you, what exactly forms standards in the industry? Sorry, who is the question to, Mega? To you, Mr. Stan. I wanted you to have a look at the results that, that we got here. So, um, also standards are in, in, in all that we do, whether we realize. Yeah. yeah. Carry on. Yeah. So as I was saying that I just wanted to have a look at the responses that we got. It's quite interesting. We have a kind of a tie and with 25% saying yes and maybe as well. Uh, 
at this point of time what exactly forms standards in the industry and also what kind of value does it hold uh in the region okay uh, apologies to everyone there standards are the same to be um you have a choice uh, standards either come from our own perspective um as individuals or standards come from an industry and sector perspective where we get together in, in different uh, organizations such as um being one for facilities management in UAE um such as mefma or standards come from international standards bodies such as the ISO in all of those it's standards that are there to help us particularly in the fm sector to give us a bench which we can measure what we do and how well we do it relative to the specific demands of the demand organization that we serve um in terms of the iso standards for example we already have evidenced by some organizations who have achieved iso 41001 for fm where they were better prepared when it came to the covid 19 pandemic why because within that standard there is uh, instructions to try and help facilities management to prepare for this type of unplanned events and how Uh, whether you recognize it or not standards are part of to that everything that we all do um, from every different perspective particularly fm which is such a diverse discipline um the one thing that i know in all of my career in fm nobody in fm has got all answers to anything so as a minimum standards are there as a tool to help us think perhaps in a different way uh, to consider things that we hadn't previously considered thank you lost him okay i think we've kind of lost him yeah so sure, i want to come to you also uh, mr tommy i mean yeah. uh, do you have an opinion with that we have taken today with the results that we have seen and uh, also you know according to you what kind of uh, value do certifications and you know standardizations uh, have yeah going yeah, look looking looking at the results that seem fairly typical really because i think that um the professionals in terms of the people that deliver will see things from a different perspective to the clients um the clients have in their own mind what their standards are and sometimes and unfortunately the standards revolve around how much money's got to be spent to actually sort of produce and to deliver a service so um there is a problem in that in the sense that what well, prior to covid-19 there was a big problem in that scenario where uh money was a key factor how how cheap could you do it how quickly can you do it etc so you know that was always the case in terms of has it changed now i don't really know um i can only speak for the uk market it hasn't changed much at the moment because not a lot of places have gone back to work so there's no real measurement in terms of um standardization i know that in the uae uh, you know they've tried to standardize in terms of um asking for particular qualifications for staff um whether it be the operational staff which is the majority or or management staff which is also fine um but my uh, my bugbear is that the, the fact is no matter how much qualifications the staff have what they do in terms of standardization really is about what happens on the the front line um i think that you know especially in the uae where you're very reliant on uh, foreign labor uh there is a a gap between the understanding of what they are taught um, and what they are certificated for and and what they deliver uh, as has been the problem in the past so although you know because i'm in educational education has a part a part a strong part to play in what we do and how we deliver things but i think that in in a lot of cases it's not cohesive it's not a joint 
thing between the client and the service provider and the staff. You know, sometimes it's, it's just done on a whim. Sometimes it's done because it's compliant. Um, mm. uh, but there's, it's in some cases and not all cases, there's just not a lot of follow-up in terms of um, someone's been trained. Yes, they've been trained. They've reached a certain level. But has anybody gone back and said, well, are they actually using the process that we trained them in and in cleaning unfortunately that does lapse and it does it is very it's lacking and it's evident in terms of what people do you still see people you'll teach them how to use a dust mop and then you'll see them on the on the shopping mall and they're still shaking the dust mop like it's you know <laughs> like there's no tomorrow so uh, you know it all has its place i'm not you know i wouldn't um I wouldn't say that any form of standardization is good. It's good for the industry, in, in our industry, for, for instance. But at the moment, it's very fragmented. Um, we all have our vision of what a standard should be. But it's, for me, it's not cohesive enough. Sure, that's right. I mean, Ms. Hin, I want to bring you into the discussion now again. You know, we're talking about the pandemic and the training, uh, uh, you know, the training aspect. So I want to ask you, you know, is there a need to really relook at the way we train professionals? And also, I do understand DREI has already started uh, training classes uh, in physical proximity. So what, how did you kind of address the entire COVID situation? Um, uh, first of all, uh, we're lucky that we had our digital uh, uh, platform ready, but um, professionals always prepare the face-to-face uh, education, meeting their uh, peers and um, networking with, with the rest, especially with the experts uh, and the, tra uh, the trainers themselves. So um, um, we at Dubai Real Estate Institute, um, uh, as Dubai government supports the United Nations Global Compact Sustain Sustainable Development uh, Goals, the SDGs, uh, we adhered to several, especially 11, which is about sustainable cities and communities. So the training programs at Dubai Real Estate Institute reflect the value propagated to the uh, SDGs uh, to ensure the continuous develop development of the real estate profit in Dubai. And um, um, we at Dubai State Institute, we train uh, in Sharjah, Ajman, and uh, Bahrain. Uh, other institutes, we, we train Dubai real estate model since it's a successful uh, model um, um, and very powerful and, and supporting the economy. Uh, this industry commands a professional to be. Um, adequately trained in technologies such as digital marketing, online investment, property tracking uh, tools, which was in a very big need during the COVID and during the pandemic after the lockdown uh, as well. Um, real estate pra practitioners willing to do what it takes to succeed uh, actively seeking out opportunities for training. And uh, it's our job to raise the, the knowledge, the awareness, um, on the importance of the education and also keep them updated with, with the, the uh, um, uh, business and the, the market um, uh, uh, needs and the Dubai Land Department rules and regulations as well. The advancement of um, certified training in the UAE, especially Dubai, unlike many countries, the UAE has several certification, including um, on aspects of sustainability, a green building, safety, and so on. Uh, all these signs of a sophisticated market. So real estate professionals are expected to have a good understanding of uh, the regulatory and sustainability certification. Um, at the end of the day, they need to help their clients to make um, uh, the best uh, and the informative decisions of, of buying a property um, or, or uh, leasing one. Right. So, uh, uh, I think also developing comprehensive thinking. Um, um, with the COVID, uh, things are changed, business and, and uh, administrative uh, intelligence, uh, the market, uh, the market know-how and uh, uh, real estate laws, uh, the economic cycles, the maps, um, realtors must be equipped with uh, to meet the client needs. Um, um, the market is very dynamic and changing, so professionals uh, has to be mindful of such changes. So um, uh, right. the training is not about the basic skills anymore. It's about um, uh, uh, to be up to the standards, 
to meet the client's uh, changes, the client um, um, behavior change, the business and the business models change. So uh, the, the training courses um, has been like tweaked uh, to fit with the, the changes or the new norm that this pandemic caused. Right. Mr. Stan, lovely to have you back. I'm glad. Uh, I hope we don't face any more technical glitches. But uh, just to get back uh, into the whole question of, you know, re-looking at standardization, you were telling us a bit of what exactly goes into making a standard in the industry. And in that perspective, uh, do you think that there is a need also to re-look at it? I, I don't think there's a need to re-look at it and I'll give you some information that not many people know. Um, in November this year, we will be starting work on a new international standard for how does facilities management react to pandemics. Okay. So we're going to create uh, a standard that will guide facilities managers on how they can prepare for such events because the reality is whilst this experience is all new for us, there is nothing new about pandemics. They have been happening for many, many years and they will continue to happen. So part of our role and responsibility within the FM sector is at least to be prepared. It's part of contingency planning. Um, so we are starting work uh, in November to create an international standard for that purpose. Um, so I don't think there's any need to change anything about how we develop standards. What we do need to do is we need to make sure that we are a truly international representation into how those standards are developed. And I will give you one example because it's relevant to everybody on this call is the UAE is, is a member of ISO 267. But the UAE to date has never set, sent any representation to contribute to the development of the content of the standards. So there is nothing stopping the UAE doing that. In fact, I have tried very hard to encourage that to happen because if you're going to create an international standard, it has to truly represent the world. Uh, we currently have 48 countries, which will soon become 50 countries who are involved. Um, so I, I know who's all in the audience, but I would very much encourage the powers that be to communicate with your national standard body, UAE, to create a committee. And all you need to do is very simple to do, and I can help people do it. And then that committee can send experts to make sure that your specific perspective on what should be in any standard is becomes part of that standard when it's published. So nothing wrong with the process, but we do need to encourage participation to, to get the value. Because as I said earlier, none of us in FM have got all the answers. So we need that collective input to make sure that the standards that do create are relevant to as broad a, uh, a community as possible. Right. Of course. And of course... Nothing happens without, you know, uh, encouraging the entire community to talk about it. And that's, we hope that this kind of webinars would set that uh, kind of maybe base where people can be encouraged to start talking about it and maybe set new standards and best practices as well. So definitely, you know, we're looking, uh, I mean, Ms. Hind did talk about certain uh, uh, initiatives that uh, DREI has also taken towards their training. So, Mr. Tommy, I want to ask you, like, you know, what kind of training methods uh, should one use, especially now in the new normal, you know, when it comes to cleaning and FM, where majority of the challenges can be to an extent the language and the use of technology to the kind of people that we are training out here, and also to a large extent, cost also can come into play. So, what kind of methods would you suggest? Um... I, I, I always, in terms of um, looking at the foot soldiers, i.e. the operatives, uh, I always would say hands-on training is, is always going to be the best. Um, people learn a lot more visually uh, in terms of, you know, just being 
able to see how something is done rather than having written or doing it online. Um, you know, you've got barriers in terms of uh, education. You also have barriers in terms of uh, language, demographics. So mm -hmm. although it's not always cost effective to be able to get people together, it, number one for me is always face-to-face, -face, hands on training, because we are an industry that, you know, we, we work predominantly with our hands. That's all we do. Um, and the operatives are the majority. Uh, they're the ones that deliver the service. They're the ones, by and large, are customer facing. Um, and they are the ones that are using the equipment and the chemicals, etc., that are provided for them. So I would always say um, hands on skills training, whether it's certificated or not, is always the key to an element of success within a contract because if you get that right if you get your staff working to a standard within a, a contract let alone an organization or globally if you can get them all to working within a particular standard within a location then you're 30 you know you're, you're almost three quarters there in terms of you know what's necessary in terms of delivering a service right and we do have uh, a very interesting comment by Ms. Manuela, uh, who says that standards are important as we need to ensure uh, outcome of our service is consistent and um, it can yeah. be repeated over time. And we need, as cleaning industry, strong standards operating the procedures. And I agree with her 100%. And, and Manuela would also know uh, through experience, uh, through talking to some of the people in our part of the industry or our sector, that it's not cohesive. Um, you know, there are a lot of people that are not working for the industry, they're working for themselves and they're, what they're doing is they're looking for standards and that, that meet their needs, not necessarily our industry. And that may seem critical, but yeah. having, having seen it demonstrated, I know. Um, and I'll just give you a quick example. If you get to the situation where we had the outbreak in March, um, there were individual stroke organisations setting themselves up as people who can decontaminate and disinfect, who had no experience whatsoever about cleaning. They were just buying a piece of equipment, getting some disinfectant, mm -hmm. and they were out there just doing their own thing. And that just shows you how fragmented our industry is because nobody's pulled them up. Basically, what they've done, they've been able to sell their product to a particular client. The client's taken it based on their lack of information and their knowledge, and they've paid for something that may not even work. Um, so, you know, I agree with Manuel 100%, but she also knows, like three of our colleagues that are online now, that in terms of the UK and, and surrounding countries, standards are fragmented because people are not working together. Um, and, and that's the problem. You know, we should have, by now, we should have a set of, as she says, a set of uh, SOPs that people work towards. We should have a basic standard that people should work towards, i.e. whether it be uh, colour coding, et cetera, et cetera. You know, there's compliance that needs to be done that should be there without, without you know, regard. It should be, you know, risk assessment should be available, safe systems of work should be available. And along with that, there should be training for the staff and the operatives to be able to understand exactly what they do and how they should do it. Completely agree. And of course, uh, she says that is why the industry, we need to elevate and responsible cleaning providers and educate the users in conducting strong due diligence. But I think there will be a lot of challenge. I'm sure many people who are there in the audience also are part who are training people. And as I said, uh, language can be a huge barrier. And especially now when we cannot really train them hands on, technology can have its own barriers. So has that kind of something that we need to relook on how to overcome th that aspect of it uh, is that to me that question yes i mean it's open yeah. to yeah all I, as well. I, I, I think that yeah i think only speaking from speaking from our industry again is that uh, uh, having worked in the uae uh, the demographics of the operational staff you know are mainly from uh, from Southeast Asia, uh, where you've got different languages, different dialects, you've got different educational levels. And we have the same situation here in the UK, where, you know, you can go onto a particular contract and you can have, you know, it's almost like a representation of the United Nations. You could have at least 15, 20 people from different countries. So you've got different languages, different understanding. So although um, technology uh, has its place in terms of delivering uh, certain aspects of training. Um, 
for me personally, that's not that's not the forefront. That may be for people who are uh, from middle management upwards, but for your operatives, um, they really do need hand holding. They you know they need to be able to because they can understand. It's not if I'm showing you how to mop a floor, I don't need to speak the same language. And I've learned that. Mm. So basically what you do is you're able to show them and they can understand from you looking at them and showing them what happens. But when you come to the situation where there's dialogue involved, then that's where you're going to have a problem. Right. And Ms. Hin, uh, you had also mentioned that there were a few changes that you had made during uh, your in your training courses. So what have been the kind, some of the new elements that you have added, uh, you know, especially post uh, the pandemic that can definitely help uh, the future generation? Yeah, uh, key additions, uh, which are uh, we have introduced new projects focusing on youth and preparing the new generation, especially Emiratis, for such a, uh, uh, to be ready to work in such a lively uh, industry. A um, couple of topics, uh, such as design thinking skills and digital transformation and real estate um, to improve their old business models um, uh, to fit with the new uh, norm. Um, based on actions of our leaders, um, and the crisis management research uh, by um, institutions such as Harvard and MIT, we have also added to the top executive a uh, couple of topics, which are uh, empathy, communication, responsibility, and future planning and strategies um, uh, within the, the training courses for the top management. Um, personal skills beside the real estate skills. Um, emotional intelligence. This is also another uh, model that we added to make sure that all professionals uh, have these four core competencies. Self-awareness, uh, self-management, social uh, social awareness, and uh, relationship management. Especially with the pandemic and the virtual movement, such uh, competencies needs to be very well managed to succeed in their leads. Sure. Uh, Mr. Stan, uh, I want to ask you, you know, there's been a lot of, over the last few webinars that we've done in this series, one of the main things that came out was the lack of synergy between the three sectors that we are talking about today, be it cleaning, be it, uh, you know, FM as well as real estate. But do you think that that's something that if we imbibe in the training or in the standards, that's something that we can overcome or it could improve the overall standards in the industry in totality? Uh, yes, of course it can. Um, for example, we we are very connected as an ISO committee with the Asset Management Committee, which is all about the real estate and the, the, the high-level asset management. So we work very closely together and we've published papers about what's the difference between uh, real estate and FM. Um, and there is a difference because the real estate typically is is focused on the asset, on the, the, the physical uh, space, if you like, uh, and the, the assets that go within it, whereas FM is very much more focused on the people and how the organization functions within that asset. Um, and and that there's a lack of understanding, uh, if I would uh, be, offer that comment in terms of where we complement each other because we do complement each other and the same thing is appropriate when you talk about the cleaning industry or the security industry or the maintenance industry um, all three of these different sectors succeed when we work together when we have a clarity of understanding of roles and responsibilities where the standards um, that are applicable in each are utilised and welcomed rather than resisted, which is sometimes the case. And, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the comment was made earlier by Manuela about um, due diligence. If I see a problem like Tommy commented on and highlighted about um, a lot of the so-called cleaning companies that suddenly emerged when COVID emerged, um, mm. to me, that is something that is all about procurement of services, procurement. Um, and if if we are a professional discipline, uh, these things should not be allowed to happen. 
because if we do our job properly, that due diligence highlights that those kind of cleaning companies or maintenance companies actually don't have the proper competencies and qualifications within their staff. Now, I think UAE in the region has done an awful lot to raise those standards within the whole Middle East region. And uh, to some degree is the 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 pivot around which the rest of the region is uh, developing and evolving, and that's to be encouraged and complemented. Um, but those three distinct sectors aren't so distinct, in my opinion. We all rely on each other to best serve the demand organisations that we're there to serve. Thank you for that. I mean, uh, definitely, you know, as you mentioned that there has been a lot of emergence of uh, new service providers, but I think uh, if the standards are definitely put in place, I think that's something that we can still curb to a last, large extent. And before we get into the next section of our discussion, I definitely encourage all of you out here to ask in your questions so I could address it to our speakers. We do have a uh, limited time. So, do make use of that. So coming back to the next uh, section of our discussion, you know, what exactly is the need of the ER right now? Uh, Ms. Hind, would you want to answer that? What do you think is really needed uh, in the industry right now to ensure that there are good standards and good training practices in place? Um, um, I would say two things. Um, digital strategy, strategy in place and to be future ready for a better, a sustainable, um, in the long run, whether as professionals working in the industry or firms as well. So um, two main things. And Mr. Tommy, how would you, what, what do you believe is the need of the hour right now? Um, I think the need of the hour is for... Uh, I don't mean to be flippant about it. I, th I think in terms of our market, I think we need to calm down now. I think we need to calm down and find our feet. Um, we're going to need to adjust to a different way of working, um, a different way of understanding. Um, I compliment um, in terms of what Stan's doing with his organization and trying to, you know, get everybody together. Um, and I would very much, you know, welcome the day when, the clean industry could say, yeah, we've got 48 countries working hand in glove and, and actually producing something. So, you know, we're a long way. We're a long, long way from that in our industry, to be perfectly frank. I, I've spoken to colleagues, some online who work in the UAE and have told me about the difficulties they've had in setting up in terms of doing disinfection and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, it has a value uh, because that organization is an established organization. They've got the equipment and the practices in place to be able to do that. Where on um, in the UK, it was a bit more haphazard in terms of people just doing their own thing and just getting it at the, what they regard as being the right price. So uh, the new hour for me would be, uh, to be perfectly frank, where our industry can work hand in glove where and our industry can actually direct government rather than having it the other way around which has been the the case in the past four months government has a lot of intervention and telling us what to do i'm not saying it's all wrong um but i personally think that our all, our sort of uh our part of the industry has, has been lacking in sort of getting out there and actually setting the standards, setting the protocols that people need to work to so we don't have the situation where someone could just turn up with a cloth and some disinfectant and say, I could do the job for you. Right. And Mr. Stan, uh, how about you? What do you believe is the need of the R right now, especially when it comes to standardization and relooking at training methods? I think I think the the need of the hour is I'd answer it two ways. One is, uh, and to be flippant, it's about raising standards, um, and it's about whatever sector we're talking about. It's about getting standards that can be uh, internationally agreed and understood, and then educating marketplace, educating government, educating corporate organisations about how important that is. And it's a great opportunity right now to try and make that happen, particularly in the cleaning sector and in the FM sector. Um, 
The other comment I would make is the need of the hours is the realization that digitization is going to play going forward. Um, the future of FM cleaning and real estate is inherent with digitization. The technologies are there today. As a company, we're using them extensively um, around many countries in the world. And the value that that digitization can bring imagine, is something as a sector, as several sectors, we need to realize and harness and uh, deliver the value that they offer to the different uh, organizations that we serve and, and countries that we serve. Right. And of course, you know, Ms. Manuela adds to that kind of thing that we do need transparency and professionalism as well as collaboration across the different segments of the industry and to add as a cohesive voice. I think that's a great way to put it and summing up our uh, discussion as well. Of course, I'd like to ask the audience if there are any questions uh, that you would want to address uh, to any of our panelists today. Uh, do uh, ensure that you type it in the chat box. We do have about five minutes left into the discussion, so do make use of it. I guess we do have one question who uh, Mr. Hussein has asked, will robot or artificial intelligence take over the role of real estate agents? <laughs> Ms. Hen, <laughs> 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 no. um, I think uh, during Expo 2020, we will see a couple of robots there doing lots of things, even mm -hmm. taking place of doctors. So yes. I don't think that we as investors or human ready to just virtually talk, a talk to a robot to buy a two million property. We will need that personal touch. There are people who are investors would like to do it. You know, they have trust. They can do it all uh, digitally. But... As humans, despite the pandemic or any crisis, we don't put our investment unless we're 100 sure that we did that uh, personal communication and personal touch and investing, especially if it was a distance investment. Like, for example, I'm, I'm from a different country trying to buy in Dubai, then I will need a broker to, to guide me to the best property, best investment, and so on. Virtual and, you know, uh, um, um, applications to ease the registration, yes, but to take a decision, I'm not going to talk uh, to a robot, but let's see what happens during Expo 2020 next year, inshallah. <laughs> Of course, you know, uh, robots have been uh, there for a while now. And uh, I think I have kind of made my peace with it initially. I was like, okay, what's happening? But yeah, <laughs> I guess it's only natural for Mr. Hussain to feel that way. I hope that answers your question, Mr. Hussain. And um, we do have someone else who I think Mr. Hussain is also typing another question. We'll just wait for another few minutes before we conclude the discussion. But uh, Mrs. Stan, what is your opinion about technology taking on, you know, our industry in quite a huge way, in fact? And do you feel that to an extent that... Yeah, I, I printed a paper about a year ago, maybe 18 months ago in Dubai for uh, MEFMA context and... Um, the, the title of the paper was the nanosecond FM and the autonomous building. Uh, technology exists today and is being used today where the building will tell the cleaning industry, the maintenance industry, the FM sector or the real estate when it needs our help. Um, that is a vision that is maybe a little bit scary for many of us, but it's a vision that says technology exists to do that right now. And in, in key facilities management, we're using some of that technology right now in terms of rationalizing the use of space, the cleaning requirements, et cetera, et cetera. It will yeah. never happen that it will replace the human being, the human touch, the human uh, perception of what's working, what's not working, etc. So whilst uh, we may, some of us may be thinking this is going to cost jobs and employment, but it will create different jobs and different employment at the same time. We're in the industrial revolution number four, and everybody said they had the same concerns about one, two, and three. 
but uh, mm -hmm. we overcame all of that. It just the economics changes, uh, as does human nature and how we interface with the workplace. So, yes, technology is going to transform the future. There's absolutely no doubt about that. It's already doing it. But I think we'll all still be around with something useful to do while it does. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So I think uh, we we have a rather shy audience today. Not that many questions. So we kind of have to let go of all of you. But that certainly was quite an insightful and very engaging conversation for me, at least. And we certainly hope that this will help us really bring back the focus on education, on training professionals in the next phase, and you know, kind of bring in that synergy that we are all talking about. I have always believed that learning is a continuous process, and the day we feel that we have reached that kind of a level where we don't really need to learn anymore is when we stop growing completely. And we hope that Community Talks has been a great journey for us, especially in terms of understanding the industry and also helping us connect in a whole new normal place that we're talking about. So we conclude our series with this episode, but we definitely do not conclude our learning process. We will be bringing more such interesting sessions involving other sectors as well. So do watch out for that. And in the meantime, I would like to thank the few, all of our panelists over here today who have come, taken the time out for us and provide us with your knowledge. And of course, I would like to thank our audience for being part of today's session as well as the entire series. And also, I'd like to thank our key sponsor, Farnik, who has supported us through this initiative. So thank you again. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And Eid Mubarak to everyone in advance. And do stay safe. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Yeah.